Thanks guys, Laird, it's amazing to be here in person with you. It's so great to have you here in Malibu and Susan, thanks for joining from the East Coast and for both of you to participating in this Farmer's Footprint series, you guys are our connection to the ocean. Yes. And when we were talking with the Farmer's Footprint team, everything's about farming, everything's about regeneration and we all realized there's no episode on the ocean. And it seems like this happens all the time where we're talking about sustainability, regeneration, organic, all of these things. And then there's this huge void of discussing the ocean, which is imperative. And you guys are going to inform us on that. But first, I just want to ask you both, and Laird, we'll start with you because you're right here with me. Can you speak a little bit about your connection to the ocean and like what kind of brought you into loving it, living it, and and recognizing it's just power and and you know your connection to it really. Well, I mean, my my relationship with the ocean started probably before I came out, right? So my mom was a surf. My mom surfed. Um, her friends were all surfers in Southern California, and so there was a beach culture. So I was kind of I think I was already being exposed to the ocean before I was born and then and then you know my playground was the beach and then my mom took me uh, to Hawaii which the ocean is you know for, for the Polynesians for anybody from an island it's just a central part of your it's everywhere you look is the ocean and if you're not participating and engaging in the ocean then you're you're not participating and engaging in the largest the largest kind of uh, element that there is, which is the element of travel, it's the element of food, it's where everything, you know, it's where everything's happening. So, it, and it's, I mean, once you start connecting to it that way, then then you're, you know, you just, I mean, I, I always tell people, I go, surfers, just, and it, we just, surfing's an excuse to have a relationship with the ocean. Mm -hmm. That's why you surf. You surf so that, I mean, people go, how do they go out there at six in the morning and I see them just sitting there and there's not even a wave. I go, because it's really a, an excuse to be in the water and be in the ocean. Otherwise, you'd just be sitting there and people would be like, what's wrong with them? You know? <laughs> those people are sitting there in the ocean for hours. What, what are they doing? Like, you know, I mean, it's like if you're meditating on a mountain, they'd be like, oh, they're meditating. But so in a way, it's, I think that that's, mine began early and then, and then it, it and because of the environment, my relationship would became very extreme. Like I have an extreme relationship similar to Susan. Susan's extreme relationship is different than mine, but equally as extreme. You know? Yeah, well, yeah exactly. When I first learned of Susan's work, I was like, oh my God, she's a badass. Um, so Susan, why don't you go same question? Oh, well, I should also add though that Laird forgot to say that he was actually born in the water. Right? Really? Well, no, my no, it, no, because it's a bathosphere. So they were doing a thing with they were pulling on the on my mom's stomach when I was uh, when I was a kid. I mean, when, when I was in my mom's womb, they had this reverse thing that was giving me room to move. I mean, we're born in water because we're in water, <laughs> but we're in water, right? Like everybody doesn't realize. They go, when you're in the womb, it's it's just a bubble of water that you're in. So. You know, and I, I imagine it's probably salty. I would give it, you know, because we're made of salt water. So you had extra room to practice. I your did. Food. I did. Well, that's true. They did create room and make. You know, I think the being born in water, I think, is a little bit morbid, more morbid than people think. They glamorize it, but I think it's a little gooey and gooey. Like I don't think it's so. I don't think it's so pretty. It's not like a pretty thing. You're like, oh, you're born in the water. I'm like, yeah, I think it was a little. The water might have been red. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, well, so uh, the, the planet, everybody talks about the planet being covered 70% in ocean, and um, that is absolutely true. But what I prefer to think of it as is a three-dimensional living space. So as a biosphere, the ocean is actually 98% of the planet. So anything that's 98% of the planet, I'm curious about because that is the planet. So I, uh, I was, unlike Laird, didn't grow up in an ocean environment, but I really um, was always drawn to water, just period. Like, and I grew up around a lot of lakes in, um, in north of Toronto, uh, and I would, had a long career as a competitive swimmer. And to me, the ocean was just always just sort of the big game, right? Like, you can swim in the lake, you, I even like pools, but... You know, if you really want to go to the big show, you're going to the ocean. And from the very beginning, it occurred to me that you 
it almost struck me as extremely compelling that there was a surface, and if you were to go through that surface, there's this parallel universe happening below, and we don't get to see any of it. And so every so often, these amazing creatures would rise to the surface. You know, in, in, early on, it was freshwater fish, but then I started writing about great white sharks, and I saw whales, and the idea that anything could pop to the surface, just something extraordinary. Um, I mean, what else is down there? What else is going on? So to me, it was just the, the sort of the summit of curiosity, just to find out what was going on in the ocean, to understand it, because that to me is understanding the earth. Mm. So we can't actually talk about anything having to do with our lives, our health, anything, unless we um, not only consider the ocean, but place it central to the discussion. Yeah. And well, and I, I, I mean, and I don't mean to interrupt, but the, also I think one of the issues that, that we have with the ocean is that it, like the reason why you realized, hey, we need to do something on the ocean, because it's a little bit out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. So that's the problem. It's kind of over there. And as, a, as anyone that participates in the water, it's not over there, it's over here. So, and so for most people and mo po most populations, it's kind of over there. Oh, it's a place that we just go rake. All, you know, we take we take nets and we pull all the fish out yeah. and we dump all our trash in. Yeah. I mean, we just use it like it's like it's like it's like a disposable rag or yeah. something like that. Like we, we when we want to use it, we use it. When we don't want to, we abuse it. We just are, are are so. I think that's one of the the battles that we have when regards to to education for people for and and concern ultimately, right? How yeah. do we get people concerned? about what's going on because it's a little bit like oh the ocean you know and then you can't see i always said if the ocean was upside down yeah and you could see the whales in the sky and you could see the pollution you'd be like hey don't be dumping the barrels don't be dumping that ddt over there in the <laughs> in the you know don't dump that over there yeah. like because you'd see it but it's kind of like you don't see you just go out dump your boat and then turn your head and it disappears yeah and so unless it floats on the surface or floats into the shore no one cares. Well, it's funny. We were just driving down the PCH on or the route one on the way here, and we were driving through all those like agricultural fields where they're just growing, and it's like pesticides and tilling, and 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 obviously working with farmers' footprint. I see this now, and I'm like, oh my god! And but because I was coming to record with you guys here, I was like, the issue is we don't see this happening in the oceans. I mean, what's happening to the oceans is way worse than this, but. We don't see it, we as you say. It. And, you know, Susan, I think it's a nice question for you because you've actually been down there. I mean, you've actually gone, you've seen the things that, like, we're talking about not being seen by the most people. And can you tell us a little bit about what's going on and the harm that we're doing to the ocean that most people might not know about? You got, you got a lifetime? You need, like, a yeah. month or two. Yeah, sorry, sorry, the abbreviated version. Yeah. Um, I mean, out of sight, out of mind is really important, but to back up even further, one human characteristic is that if we can't see something, we think it doesn't matter, and it's a very immature way to approach life, and a lot of the things that really uh, impact us are invisible. Like we religion, like God. <laughs> yeah. You know, chemicals. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we, we have to, the first thing I would say is we need to move past this notion, um, and I guess we need to sort of outstep our own evolutionary progress, but we need to understand that just because we don't see it doesn't mean it doesn't exist or it doesn't matter. Um, and a lot of, you know, the ocean being 98% of the planet, the animals that live there, and of, of that 98%, 95% of that is deep ocean. So that is the waters below um, 600 feet. So it's darkness, right? Effective darkness. So most of the biosphere of the earth lives in complete darkness. So the large-brained creatures like, uh, you know, they also communicate like um, dolphins and whales that have been around for tens of millions of years, hundreds of millions of years longer than we have, do not use vision as their primary means of navigating and assessing their world. They um, go through frequency, vibration, acoustic, no, like we, we are going to have to expand our sensory palette in order to be able to understand the effects that a lot of the uh, you know, a lot of things on the planet are having on us. A lot of the things in the ocean that are most insidious are microplastics and um, nanoparticles that you couldn't see. I mean, we can obviously see the most obvious, you know, ghost nets, big chunks of plastic, things that are 
um, discarded, and you do see that. Um, even if you go down several miles in the ocean, you'll find plastic bags. I had a scientist tell me that he was at um, almost 36,000 feet in a submersible, and a plastic bag floated past the viewport of the submersible with the words eco-friendly <laughs> clearly visible on it. So that's one thing, but you know, it's all the other things. It's the microbial life that is being impacted by rising temperatures, by chemicals. These are not things that we could see even if we do go down there. And you know, but they're they're critical. They're the foundation of all life, you know? Of course. And Susan, what are what are we dumping in the oceans? You know, like Well the better question is what aren't we? What, because there's yeah, nothing that's not going, it's all ending up. Everything on land's ending up in the ocean. If we're not dumping it directly, everything from the land washes to the ocean. So there's really, uh, there's nothing not going in the ocean. Right, and, and there's a, as, as Laird said, you know, there's a long ignominious history of us using the ocean as a dump site. And I mean, it, it, uh, until very recently, it was considered to be the way to uh, dispose of all of our old weapons. You know, there are these huge weapons dumps in the ocean and a lot of them have chemical still active chemical agents in them like mustard gas and fishermen will pull up things in their nets there was a huge um uh, in the puerto rico trench which is you know uh where two tectonic plates meet um you know deep sort of v-shaped trench it was a huge pharmaceutical dump site for many many years and like just vast amounts of um discarded drugs were put in there and so you can find absolutely anything that the ocean is the final sink that's where everything goes. And when you get into these very deep parts, these uh, these trenches that between at the seams between the tectonic plates, that is where eventually everything comes to rest. And so it, in the Mariana Trench, which is the deepest of them, uh, they it's more polluted in the sediments than in China's dirtiest rivers. Um, they have everything. They have heavy metals like cadmium, they have lead, radioactive isotopes from nuclear bomb testing there are like so much there's so much plastic and so finely uh like degraded not biodegraded because there's still chemicals freighted with other chemicals and some of the most toxic chemicals we've ever created stick to plastic and they're very long lived so they get into the um into the organs into the um, physical structures of animals there are actually little crustaceans down there called amphipods that have so much plastic in their bodies that they're not fully organic anymore. They are hybrid plastic organic creatures um, and the species that they found most recently, they named it Plasticus because they couldn't actually find an individual that wasn't completely embedded with plastic. Um, and we know that, it, that ingesting those chemicals and all of that, it. it affects their immune systems, it affects their reproductive success, it, it, these are neurotoxins. I mean, um, when I asked the scientists who discovered these little crustaceans that they called plasticas, like how many other animals do you think have this body, body burden of plastic in the deep ocean? And he said all of them. And on a, on a more, can we go over the more positive? I started, you know, God, which, I started which, crying. Which, but I also, I think it's important also to understand that everything that all of the things that have existed are down there too right so every single the dna probably from every single thing that's ever existed on earth that's right lies it's within the, the bottom of the ocean yeah. too so it's like the and i told susan this the last time that we were together that i had this theory that you know how man's making the cloud and putting all the information into the cloud and i go in the way the ocean is the cloud of the earth and every single thing that ever existed is in the ocean and every DNA that's in, so in a way that's also a reason to be protective of it because it's like you're what are you going to go in and you're going to blow up the library you're going to you're going to you're going to you're going to burn the library down like in a way I think and, and already you know I think the last time we spoke about a microbe that 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 they found that can go break the blood brain barrier and then go in and like um, work it kill cancer cells kill cancer cells like in brain yeah. tumors so that's just an example of yeah. okay we got this every single wor worst chemicals in the trench but so is in in that bios like how thick is that layer of of organic material in the bottom in some places of the ocean i mean i, I feel like miles right like um i mean there's um thriving life microbial 
microorganisms as deep as a mile beneath the seabed, but it's not all sediment. And But, you know, there are pores and fissures and cracks in the ocean crust, and there's life in those. And um, But the sediment itself, I'm not exactly sure how thick it is, but it's, you know, thick enough. I mean, because it, it you know, it could be hundreds of feet thick. Yeah. And have, and, and have it's all kinds of strange, alive. yeah, and have and, yeah. and alive, hundreds of feet thick, alive, and yeah. then have all this stuff to to be to be understood and to be you know and and ultimately have they're probably I would think everything that we've ever needed to cure everything we ever we have is absolutely. there absolutely you know um, you know one 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 sort of scientific anecdote that really to me represents just how rich that environment is, is that they took something like 418 sediment samples from various deep seabed areas, ran it through a DNA sequencer, came up with 2 billion DNA sequences and 100,000 DNA variants, which represent, and 60% of those DNA variants represented creatures that were not just new to science, but were new on the tree of life, like new, not just new species, but new organisms, new types of life. Um, so like as above, so below, right? Mm -hmm. Anything we do uh, to ourselves, to our upper life, it's going to end up in the ocean. So if we trash the planet, we're, we're trashing the ocean. Yeah. The ocean is the planet. Yeah. And it's so interesting. Like, so the first podcast I did for this whole series was with Zach Bush, obviously. And he talks about this so much of like, he brought up this anecdote. He was like, I actually looked up what the dictionary says when they define nature. And it says, nature is everything except man and what man creates. And he what? was like, yeah, like that is the, in like the Miriam dictionary that is, and he was like, and right there, there's the issue. He's there's like, the problem. we yeah. are defining ourselves as separate from nature and everything we create is separate from nature where everything we create touches nature and nature is us and therein lies the rub so yeah. it seems to me like this is exactly what you guys are talking about as well it's like we cannot think of ourselves as separate from the ocean like laird you said well, you were made up other. of water well, yeah each other yeah well, i mean starting with like groves yeah we're separating ourselves from each other and we have all this inner we have all these inner battles going on just that and we're it's like i, I told somebody it's like everybody fighting like the crew is fighting on a boat that's sinking and you're like you're fighting each other and the boat's sinking but we're all on the same exact boat like by the way it's not like a different boat it's not like china's on a different boat than india's on a different boat and somehow we're on a different boat no we're on the same boat we're all and it's only one boat it's yeah. the only boat we have right now yeah. and we're all having this we're distracted from the from the you know the the real issues at hand and the ocean just is the I mean, that's the blood, that's the blood life of the planet. My friend calls it the soup of life. Everything that comes, came, is, every living thing comes from the ocean. It's like the ocean is the, you know, that's where the oxygen is, that's where the, and we're just pretending like there's just no end to it. There's some crazy, I heard a crazy, uh, a, a crazy story. I think it was in, about hum, uh, hum, Hubble, Hubble, the Hubble current, you know, this Hubble, and he was just talking Hubble about, yeah. that they had, some guys had said that they believed that the ocean was in, uh, inexhaustible like that there you could you would never be able to fish the ocean out like back back you know 150 200 years ago that's what they believe mm. they believe that you just wouldn't be able to so are the vast it was so vast in our minds at that point that we thought we could never fish it out and now we're like wow there's no fish like they've just I mean lately we've been just wiping out every single I mean we're not doing it man's doing it and even if we are so environmentally concerned in America, as a, and, and there's a certain luxury to that. I always say there's a luxury to complaining. We're sitting yeah. here going, you know, <laughs> we got to do this. And yeah, because we're fluent enough to be able to do it. If you're not eating and you don't have shelter, you could care less about trash. Yeah. You go to a third world country, you go to Peru or some of these places yeah. that we travel to. They don't care. They store the trash on the side of the road because they're hungry. Yeah. They're not thinking about, oh, like, let's put all the aluminum together yeah. and recycle. Yeah. They're not recycling them because they're just trying to cycle, not recycle. They're just trying to live. Of and course. so... I think that's a, one of the things that we have is that we're, you know, people, yeah, and then we get into, okay, well, you know, okay, don't use straws. And I'm like, yeah, but there's enough net to go around the planet 50 times in yeah. the ocean every day. Yeah. 50 times. Like fishing net, you mean? Fishing net. Like yeah. 50 times around the planet. And then somebody wants to talk about a straw yeah. for a cup. And I'm like, uh, it seems to be 
we have some bigger issues, <laughs> you know, <laughs> than a straw. Well, it's you know? true. And I think, you know, you mentioned Carbon and Laird, and I think it's important, and Susan, like, that's a big thing, right? I mean, the ocean, we talk about regenerative farming in terms of like, it's a really good example, like a really good way to capture carbon. Like let's yeah. rebuild our topsoil, let's capture carbon. Yeah. What's the ocean's role in capturing carbon and oxygen and all of these things that are affecting climate change, our ability to live on this planet? Like, you know, the science of that, maybe Susan, if you could speak a little bit too, because I think that might hit home for some. Well, the ocean is obviously a, the, the carbon sink and the temperature sink. Um, I mean, there's more heat in the top two feet of the, the ocean than I think it's, the, I, I forget the statistic, but the ocean absorbs 90% um, of the excess heat that we've added to the atmosphere and 30% of the excess carbon dioxide. And, you know, that's an incredible burden. It obviously has impacts on it. It, it will ultimately, it, it's going to make it more acidic. It's gonna change the pH as the carbon dioxide, you know, gets into the water column, it's going to make it less um, able to have, have a richly oxygenated environment for the creatures that need that. And um, it will change the ecosystems where things can live as the temperatures warm. Um, I mean, again, it's just, it, it sounds like a broken record, but it's 98% of the planet. So it is the game for carbon, but we don't know how much it can, how much it can take. Like, all of the changes that come as a result of climate change, they're not slow creeping incremental changes. They can tip, you know, ecosystems can tip and we don't know where those tipping points are. And when we start to change the chemistry and biology of the ocean, I mean, primarily the chemistry at first, um, and the microbial um, regimes in the ocean change, we could be looking at a very different, startlingly different type of planet. And that's really not good news for us because we evolved to live on the in the Holocene in this very stable um, environment that we've had uh, for our entire existence. And that could change in our lifetimes, probably will. Um, but it's not the best news, you know? Well, no, and it's funny. So I was reading about you guys, the, the book that you wrote together called The Wave. Or well, worked on she together. wrote, worked and on, I, had, I have a chapter. Yeah, in worked on together, yeah. sorry. Yeah. And, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and... Smart and... Uh, security <laughs> <laughs> and it was interesting because I was I was sort of I had to skim but a lot of what I was seeing Susan was like the fact that climate change is going to affect waves like it's go you know it's like tsunamis could become more prevalent we're seeing hurricanes become more prevalent I mean it's like it used to be a once in a century storm now it's like every month you know you're seeing yeah. something well, that's like okay but we have a couple of things going on I, I, and I don't and I'll let Susan speak after but we have a couple one of our issues is that we have is that you're talking about geological cycles and then we're talking about man cycles so then you're like i can't believe it's the most it's ever rained in a hundred years and you're like yeah and it's like a two thousand three thousand fifty you know five thousand year cycle mm -hmm. and so we're talking about stuff in our terms because we can only deal with the amount of time we're here which is such a minute time it's so it's so small uh it, that's one thing so so to get into the the we've never seen storms like that before and then another piece to that for me I, sometimes people don't realize that part of extreme can be also super calm like some crazy that's what i've noticed more than anything is besides this the seasons and the cycles being completely out of line like and, and out like of their rhythm started. like it's all of a sudden it's like like this year in California, the entire summer, completely cold. Now we're in October, November, all of a sudden it heats up and it's like hot right now. I mean, luckily for us, it's hot in the, when the days are shorter instead of hot right in the middle of June on the longest day of the year. Mm. Cause, but that's just for comfort. I'm just saying, but the, the, the truth is we have these weird cycles going on where we're getting, you know, the storm generation for waves, the storms that normally are in a certain location are moving and they're in they're they're up further and they're in, they're out of their rhythm the jet stream i mean the problem is is that we have a, a lot of countries that are spending a lot of time messing with the weather so people don't want to they think a conspiracy theory but you got people i mean i have friends talking about during the olympics in china that they were worried about a rainstorm so they fired a bunch of rockets and they made it and they into the atmosphere and they did some stuff where they were just completely tampering with the weather to make it so it didn't rain during their opening. So, you know, don't think that that's not affecting the jet stream that comes across. Okay, never mind pollution, but how about just actually 
you know, man, here's man again. I know better than you, nature. I know better than you, like... Or even just, like, controlling the nature. Well, like, well, I'm saying, yeah. I know better. Yeah. So I'm going to... I think I can control it. But, you know, I, I've seen really long periods of super calm. Like, normally you'd have, okay, you know, let's say you got doldrums or you got some kind of calm weather. And you go, oh, yeah, we get that for three days. Mm -hmm. That's the longest we've ever seen. And all of a sudden, it's like three weeks of that stuff, four weeks of that stuff. So people go, extreme is always... Ex that's extreme. Yeah. Extreme calm. Right. Like, because everybody's extreme, like rain, storm, this and that. I go, some of it's just completely complacent, like right. completely numb. Yeah. Like, how bad would it be if our planet goes numb? That's, I fear more that. Mm. I, I go, if you, if, at least if there's storms, there's movement, there's current, there's, that's a life to yeah. me. And I go, when you get these big, long periods of just numbness, like, and for us, I go, a month of just completely two months, three months, a year, two years of just completely nullified weather, I would be, that, that's, I fear that. I mean, as a surfer, I fear because no waves. But, but as a, as just a human, I fear that it's just no movement. It's describing his worst nightmare. Yeah, yeah. exactly. <laughs> well, and Susan, like, what's the science behind that? Like, what's happening with these like yeah. longer? So nothing's homogenous, right? Especially in the ocean. And Laird's exactly right. But the extremes become more extreme in every way. And um, as I, I should back up and say, when I was researching the wave, which is a book about giant waves. I was looking at different people who understood them, scientists who were studying them, mariners who were getting in trouble in ships out in the ocean, and then of course Laird, and uh, the very rarefied group that he's part of that inserts themselves into the ocean at its most ferocious and its most extreme. And um, the, 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 if you need to take a sort of a top line look at it, it is true that the biggest storms are becoming bigger. You add more heat into the system, you have more energy. So um, storms can pop up more quickly, and they'll when they do pop up, they could be bigger. And when it, when when the ocean moves quickly, you get the ocean, you get the sea surface and all the energy that's within it from the wind and the storm. Um, you know the the all kinds of um, pressure things, and uh, you get waves that are less stable because they grew more quickly, and they can then be further away from equilibrium and create like. Un, very unusual seas like suddenly a, a wave might pop up that's like three times larger than the seas around it and that there's definitely going to be more of that in some parts of the ocean um, and that since the wave was published in 2010 that has definitely been proven the waves are getting bigger but not everywhere um, and in, as, as Laird said you know you put more energy someplace there's going to be less elsewhere so in the same way that we may have so much rain that there will be these floods that we've never even seen before, and we're already beginning to see the, you know, some of that. There will also be droughts that we, we've never seen before. So the just the extremes are getting more extreme, and none of this makes for like easy living. You know, yeah. it's what is just this? it's all yeah. yeah. I mean, it's definitely affecting. It's going to affect farming. Like I said, those cycles that yeah. we rely on, like crops that like you don't need a giant rain right when you're harvesting wheat because it's going to make it all you know it's going to make it all moldy it's like so you have all that inconsistency and then certain the way the cycles go if the cycles aren't moving in those normal patterns all of a sudden no oh, the animals aren't migrating and in, in time and then the thing happens and then the fruits you know it's like the bees aren't pollinating and the i mean all of these things that have been going off of our cycles when we break that i mean susan talks about i was in this i was in a thing called a rain bomb so i've been in a couple crazy thing storms and because i'm fascinated i think i don't know if it's the what's related like you love them and they come to you or you go to them because